Dave Jones. Welcome to World Building Secrets. Let's get started. You've had such an incredible, extensive career in gaming, programming, tech. How did that, how did all that happen for you? Where did that inspiration or passion for these um, industries come from? I think I was in the right place at the right time, right? Back in the, um, in the early 80s when, you know, just home computing started to take off, basically. I think, you know, for myself at my age, it was, you know, that time was like, oh, this is a brave new world I want to learn about, you know, so I've been able to, you know, not, not only buy your own PC, build your own first computer, you know, mm-hmm. which is what happened with me. So it really was just, I think, you know, way back when everything was brand new, new frontiers, yeah. everything was exciting. So I was just right place, right time, I think. Definitely. And you grew up in Scotland? Right? Yes. That's always been Scotland. Was that industry flourishing at the time there as well? Or do you think it was more kids your age, you guys kind of had to come together and um, find opportunities? <laughs> uh, it, it was a little bit of both, actually. We were very lucky in that. Um, I worked at a company called Timex Corporation. Um, in Scotland, which was known for making watches. Mm-hmm. You know, like they still is, I believe, and I'm still going. Um, but what not a lot of people realize was that Timex was actually also contracted by um, Sinclair Research, which launched a computer called the ZX Spectrum in the UK, which was really popular, mostly mm-hmm. in the UK. Um, but they were actually making those. So I was super lucky in that they were in my hometown, and I, you know, I got my first job there as an electronics engineer. Oh, that's um, and really that's what lucky. really started all yeah so mm-hmm. um once again right place right time you know yeah. it was, you know, there was definitely a lot of that for sure how old were you when you had your first job uh, 17 so straight straight from school yeah oh my into, goodness in those days apprenticeships were a big thing so the, you know the companies used to take you on train you up you know they sent you right. to college for a year as part of the job and stuff so it was it was a right. cool program actually so it was i can imagine cool. yeah. i can imagine especially at such a young age i think you, you were kind of forced to really adapt and learn um, from people that are older and have so much more experience, especially as the industry is kind of changing extremely rapidly and everyone's trying to catch on at the same time. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, did you go to college to study programming technology after that? I went to college to study actually the electronic side of stuff um, mm-hmm. because I was an electronics engineer. But as part of that, I was really interested in the programming side. So I kind of mm-hmm. self-taught myself um, programming. Mm-hmm. You know, while while I was doing the electronic side of things as well, and then eventually I left Timex because they were going through a hard time, and I thought, you know what, I I I, I really enjoy the the programming side of stuff, mm-hmm. but I knew I'd never get a job unless I had you know a degree in programming probably. So sure. after three years of working, I actually left you know voluntarily, and then went back back to college as such as a, a more mature student, mm. even though I had kind of new programming. Like I say, I, I thought I better go and get a degree and just make sure people you know, sure. know yeah. I know this program. So that's what yeah. I think that, you know, there's also a limit to you can teach yourself a lot, but especially yeah. if you want to go and start working at companies. I mean, you start working at Amiga shortly after, right? Um, yeah. A couple so, years later. Um, so when, when I left, um, the Amiga had just come out, just been launched mm-hmm. in the US. You know, and I remember all the, it was a very famous bounce and gold demo, you know, and these programs called <laughs> Deluxe Paint and all these kind of iconic stuff, you know, way back in the um, in the 16-bit era. And and I just bought myself an Amiga while I was at college just, just to, like, you know, advance my programming skills a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. And that's how I got into the Amiga side of things. And then I started, you know, being really interested in gaming at that point as well and started dabbling with, you know, writing some mm-hmm. games on Amiga while, while I was a student. Is that where the your kind of love or, I guess, maybe, like, spark for gaming really started? Or did you play games as a kid as well? I played games in the arcades, you know, so that was a big thing. Like going to school, waiting for the bus, you know, there was a, a lot of shops sure. like Space Invaders machine or Donkey Kong machine, you know, so I, mm-hmm. I used to really enjoy playing those. But um, I, I think because the Amiga was so powerful when it first came out, it was like, wow, you really could make coin-op style games now. Whereas before they were, you know, you had to squint, squint yeah. for your eyes a little bit. So. <laughs> like, Is it's there a... <laughs> That's very yeah. true. Is there any arcade yeah. game that you wish um, maybe would have been turned into a video game or has been turned into a video game? Uh, well, my first game, actually, I took a lot of inspiration from sh- like sideways scrolling shoot 'em ups There was games called R-Type and Nemesis. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they were very, very classic. But my first two games were kind of reinterpretations of those. I mean, I wasn't very creative back then. It was more like, can I actually make a game like that? You know, so and I, and I found the best way was just to take a game you love and see, you know, see if you can make a, 
something Absolutely. comparable. So, so yeah, so that, that was definitely kind of how I cut my teeth mm -hmm. as well. Especially since you probably played it before, right? So you can, you're used to it, you love it. It must be, yep. imagine yep. it was really cool to kind of try and reimagine in a different um, context. When it comes to gaming, are you more of the, do you prefer the creative side? Like, what do you prioritize when creating a game? Um, I tend to prioritize, um, I'm always looking for something new, you know, something that, you know, players haven't, you know, kind of, you know, had a taste of before. Mm -hmm. um, that was early back in the days when all, you know, all games were new. So sure. <laughs> as a year went on, that's obviously getting a little bit tougher to do. But I, I always try and, you know, think, you know, what's not been done yet? You know, what can we experiment with? Um, and also I'm very much about, you know, simplicity in terms of the core feature that, you know, you're doing a lot of. Mm -hmm. It's like that just has to be so enjoyable if we're going to play these things, you know, for many, many, many hours, days, weeks, months. Right. So I, I tend to look for, you know, just the repetitive actions. How, how much fun and engaging can you? really make those mm -hmm. when you were creating your first games did you imagine how the portability of games would develop so you're talking about game boys ps5s xboxes all of that was that something that was in your head or no. not at all yeah. yeah honestly it's like one of the things every time you think you know gaming's reached a pinnacle it's like mm. what, what else can it do then there's the next Anything one <laughs> technology comes along right gaming tends to be you know the one thing that adapts to your new technologies really quickly and then mm -hmm. you know surprises us all so much against that. Yeah, games have done it again, you know, that, that technology, you know, whether it was, you know, mobile when phones came out or VR, right. AR, you know, and streaming. I mean, there's just so much. Everything seems to, you know, go back to, to gaming. Yeah, it really does. What do you prioritize when you're developing a new game? Do you prefer single-player games, multiplayer games? Do you prefer the UI? Uh, I, I prefer multiplayer games because I love players as content. I think it's... Mm it just keeps a game alive for so much longer, you know, sure. when, when it's real people you're engaging with. So mm -hmm. I, I really love the social side of gaming. So multiplayer gaming, you know, for me is where it's, so, so I, I tend to always look at that, you know, co cooperatively and competitively. So right. I think right. between the, the two of those. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Do you, I mean, I, I imagine you, you know, games are, aren't created on their own um, and there's always a big team behind it. Do you find working with the same people you've worked with in the past? Have you worked with the, those people throughout your entire career or do you really like working with new people and new companies? I tend to do a bit, bit of both, both, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've, I've really mixed it up over the years. You know, I've met so many people over the years, you know, through working with, for example, you know, people at say Nintendo or Microsoft and like mm -hmm. you just meet some lot of smart people and then you work on a project together, you know, and then mm -hmm. in five years time, you know, you, you find out, oh, they, they're at this company now or they come to work with myself on a project. So it's a bit of a mix and match. But I mean, some of the people I've worked with for, you know, I think, you know, 35 years now, you know, way, way, way back to the very original days. So, yeah, um, I mean, yeah. Speaking of working with somebody for that long, I mean, you've worked with Tony Harmon for over two decades now. How did you guys meet? That happened. Um, I did a game called Lemmings on the Amiga, which was kind mm -hmm. of, you know, it was, it, was, it, was, it was a pretty big hit actually back in the day. Um, yes. And Tony was at Nintendo of America at the time. Um, they were about to bring out a new machine called the Nintendo 64, mm -hmm. um, which was a pretty exciting machine. And he was kind of just at a computer show in... Um, down in London, I think, you know, and looking for the kind of developers, you know, who could do, I think, you know, original Nintendo style games. Uh, and so he reached out basically, you know, it's like, hey, you know, I love some of the work you guys done previously, you know, we've got this new machine coming out, you know, would mm -hmm. you be interested in working Nintendo on that? And of course, I was like, oh, that's a dream. And it kind of went from there. We got on great, you know, we, we, we made some games together, you know, and and eventually, Tony left Nintendo and joined my company, you know, DMA mm -hmm. Design, back in the day. Um, so, yeah. So, I mean, that's another good example of, you know, we met through a different company, but we've, we've worked together for a long time since. What was the initial pitch for Lemmings? Do you remember? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I do. And, it, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't even a pitch as such. It was actually just an animation one of the programmers uh, at DMA had done. And he was just, in, you know, in his lunchtime, he was just playing around with a little animation. It was just these tiny little guys, and they were just, they were walking up a hill. At the top of the hill, he had these various machines that were just killing them in funny yep. ways, squashing them, blasting them. And it just looked, it was just a little cycling animation, you know. And he just yeah. sitting dabbling there having on his lunch. And I kind of looked over his shoulder, and I thought, can you make a game out of that? <laughs> and literally that, you know, and that was it. And that's how, simply how it was born. 
did you realize how significant that game would be for you, your career, but also the industry? Uh, no. Um, I mean, you never do. I mean, that's the thing, right? It's like, you know, you, you, you always want to make a, you know, a great game, but it is really, really hard. There is, there is no magic for it. It's, it's a lot Absolutely. of hard work, yeah. right? And, you know, it's, you know, even that again, right place, right time, you know, depending on trends and fashion and things. So, so okay. no, you're never quite sure. You're very close to the game when you're making as well. So really until you hand your baby over to somebody else who's never seen it for a few that's the only time you <laughs> yeah. really get for it. I'm sure it's also it hard like to give your baby away, right? At some point you have to let it go and yeah. um, know that there's a community out there that will make it what it's meant oh, to be right. and it, it'll, it'll be what it's meant to be. Do you yeah. separate when you create, for example, you created Lemmings and you, when you went about to create GTA Crackdown, do you separate yourself from these games? Do you ever look back on like, what did I learn from Lemmings maybe or what are some things we did there we can improve? I mean, I know they're different games, but yeah. um, in terms of oh, approaches, okay. right? Yeah, yeah. A- absolutely. Yeah. You know, like I say, it comes back to simple things like, you know, again, you know, what what was the one compelling mechanic that really resonated, you know, and um, you, you always, you know, you always like tutorials, UI, I mean, just, just stuff that you think, yeah, you know, probably could have got more people into it if they hadn't tuned out for the first three minutes. We, we really need to fix the onboarding. And mm-hmm. so everything was being developed, you know, as, you know, learning more as, as you did game by game. Definitely. Let's talk a little bit about GTA because I think that's one of your, um, yeah. one, one of the most incredible, I grew up playing that game. Um, <laughs> it was an awesome game. I think it was like the first time you could really experience the rebel lifestyle really, right? Like you could get out of car, you could shoot people, you could kill mm-hmm. people. Mm-hmm. Um, and you could choose the cars, you could change them. You could really like custom your environment as well. Right. Like you could basically, I find it ironic cause you could almost live your, like any worse nightmare in yeah. <laughs> real time, yeah. except you found it so fun. Yeah. Um, I mean, are you a car fan first of all? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah? Okay. <laughs> I couldn't okay. afford nice cars. Right. So I just, I just made a game about stealing them and, and <laughs> see where you could get to <laughs> drive all those really, really cool cars. Do you collect cars by any chance? Over the years I have, you know, that, you know, obviously GTA let me then actually buy some mm-hmm. of the cars in real life. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a big, big car enthusiast. So awesome. I, really, I yeah. grew up as a, my dad's a big, big, big car fan. He used to train with Rally. Um, oh. So I grew up around that. I think that's probably where he has three daughters. So he's, that's probably why we ended up playing GTA because I didn't know any <laughs> girls that played GTA no, no. when I was young. But uh-huh. um, how did, so how did GTA come about? Where did that inspiration come from? At the time, um, games were, pri- you know, up to that point, like I said, I'm always looking for new things. You know, what can we do that's a little bit different? And up mm-hmm. to that point, Games were very, very uh, self-contained in terms of you had a driving game or you had a first-person shooter, you know, or you had a puzzle game. It was like, hmm, I wonder if we could really just, you know, put all of those things together. Like, I love driving games. I've never done a driving game. But, you know, what if you just get out of the car? And it's just a very simple thing, right? But at that point, nobody had ever done anything like that. And it was like, okay, mm-hmm. so you, you get out of the car, and then what? <laughs> you know, so, and it was a simple thing like, well, in driving games, you crash and the car has to repair itself so you can start racing again, right? Which mm-hmm. is really good. So on this one, okay, you smash your car up, get out, just steal another car. And and that felt a bit more fun and a bit more engaging than just having a self-repairing car, right? So it's like, and then things just snowball from there, really. It, you know, and it was like, okay, you know, what if there's no cars around? Well, maybe if you shoot somebody, an ambulance came or the police came to like find out what was going on. Well, that's mm-hmm. a way to make a car up here, right? Still there. <laughs> <laughs> like, let's, let's steal the police car. What happens when you steal the wall? I can put the sirens on and <laughs> have fun to then get out of my way, you know? And it, it, it was just a joy, as you can imagine, just doing all these what if scenarios, you know? It's like, yep. it'd be great once that happens, if this, we can make this happen. How long did the game, how, do, how long did you develop the game for? Oh, uh, I think it was about between 18 months and two years. So it was it was quite a long time for games back in there. I, I, I remember thinking contractually, we said 15 months, you know, but mm-hmm. games always tend to take a little bit more. Take a little longer. A little longer than you imagine. <laughs> but because it was going so well and because we were just having so much fun, we spent a little bit longer than that on it, I think. And I think mm-hmm. it was about 18 months or two years, you know, to really get it all all polished out a very hard game to debug because like you said you can go anywhere and do anything so right and you know there were so many edge cases that you know we hadn't thought about so yeah absolutely you have to keep going back and how many times did, once you guys released the first version um was there part of you that was like oh i kind of wish we did this or oh, i wish we did oh, that we had so many more ideas <laughs> you know? so so yeah i mean then we did the expansion you know then we did two then we did three you know so i mean mm-hmm. it was 
and and that's the thing. But it's the game that keeps giving, right? Because you really you're just replicating the real world at the end of the day. The the, the best simulation you can make it, and then yeah. breaking all the rules. You know, so there's, it's just never ending. Yeah, it's. I mean, people to this day play it and will still keep playing it in 20, 30 years, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I find it incredible how there hasn't been a game that's really been able to stand up to exactly mm. what, what GTA offers you. No, it's a, um, it, it, it defines sandbox game. Well, well, that's the term came from because we didn't know what to call it. Yeah, and I was going to ask, how did the Grand Theft Auto yeah, even... Yeah. And it kind of, you know, the, 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 the two terms that people kept using, well, it's kind of like a sandbox or it's like open world, you know, and it's like, mm-hmm. so that's... I think, you know, that, that kind of helped define that genre as such. Did you come up with uh, calling it Grand Theft Auto? Uh, actually, that was, I remember the meeting very specifically. And um, mm-hmm. I mean, one of the reasons we got to do that game, because it was a bit, you know, it's pushing the boundaries at the time, right? Because games typically, because of Nintendo, et cetera, were more associated with kids more than anything else. Right. You know? so, so to do something that, you know, had a little more, you know, adult kind of, you know, um, behaviors about it was was mm-hmm. quite tricky. Not people, you know, we don't know if we can do this. Um, mm-hmm. But we we signed the original game with um, a company called BMG, Bertelsmann Music Group, because they wanted mm-hmm. to get into gaming, and they were used to you know rock stars and music and pushing the boundaries of everything. They were so they were really really encouraging, right? Which yeah, was great. Um, but no, it was, it was one of the BMG guys. I remember in a meeting, and we we're just trying to. And the original was called um, Race and Chase. It was mm-hmm. kind of like the working title. Um, but then one of the guys, you know, he just said, you know, how about, you know, Grand Theft Auto? You know, everybody just went, that's awesome. Love it. You know, so we, we stuck with that. Do you have a favorite game? Oh, uh, so over the years, uh, let me think. Like going way, way back, I used to love what Pete Molyneux used to do. He did a game called Populous, which was mm-hmm. like um, like a little God building game, two player. For me, that was like really, really good. Um, I got into MMOs at one point when one of the Dark Age of Camelot came out. That was like one of the very, very early MMOs. Um, I love World of Warcraft. Um, I, I, I just, there's, there's so many like Vampire Survivors I'm playing the hell out of just now, which. Yeah, you know, I was going to say, do you still play? I mean, I'm assuming yeah, you oh, play yeah, on yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so I, I just, like anybody else, I just go with the time mm. to see what's new. But yeah, I, I really enjoy gaming still. Is there or has there been or is there right now a gaming project that surprised you that's been doing stuff that's kind of out of the ordinary, going about it in a different uh, way than maybe you would? You know, I've just spent, you know, I just spent five years with Epic, right, on on, mm-hmm. on Fortnite, you know, from, from yeah. when it came out. And that surprised me. And not so much about how big it came, but, you know, you talked about things like, you know, normally with a game, you're like, okay, you're right. You can't make it too much PvP, for example, because then there's a lot of people don't like PvP, you know. And, sure. You know, what's the core long-term progression, blah, blah, blah. And But Fortnite kind of BR broke a lot of rules, right? It was like, well, this is a multiplayer-only game, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I was like, oh. Um, and it's you know, it's highly competitive. Um, and there's no progression as such. You go in, you have one 20-minute game, right? And then that's it. And then you just, there's nothing. There's no character progression or anything. So yeah. there's no real long-term loop there. So it kind of, you know, for me, it was like, it shouldn't have been as successful as it, as it was if you just looked at, typically you know what are all the ingredients you need right um so that one actually just really surprised me about okay you know it just goes to show you again we, we don't know anything you know when when like daisy and stuff like well when, when you know these permadeath games you know yeah. it's like oh you can play for two hours and if you die that's it you're dead and you lose all your stuff. <laughs> it's like, like yeah you could never get away and once again it was just super i love that you know i mean mm-hmm. it created a whole different atmosphere about the game so there's always things I think that you look at and think, oh, I never thought that would be as big as it was. Yeah, definitely. What do you think of uh, video games becoming adapted into movies, TV shows? I mean, we're seeing that now with The Last of Us. Yeah. Um, same with Harry Potter. Yep. Um, how do you, what do you, how do you feel about that? Uh, I mean, it's good, right? It's, it, it's been tricky. I've seen so many, you know, examples of it not working in the past. Mm. But I think, I think as games have matured, you know, and they, and they have got, really really good storylines now and you know the worlds that they're set in are are really deep you know and interesting right. i think it's just over time has become you know much easier to start to get things like the last of us to actually be mm-hmm. you know, finally you know cross yeah. media as such in a good way so i can only see it getting better which is which is great 
Yeah. I mean, I can imagine them trying to uh, reenact The Last of Us maybe five, ten years ago. And you wouldn't, you know, with without the right technology and the right mm -hmm. cast and the right, you know, um, honestly, just production behind it. It just wouldn't translate what you really want to translate. And then, honest, that could jeopardize the game itself as well, which um, yeah. is a risk, you know. Yeah, it always is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But no, it was a great collaboration. You could see the game director was heavily involved in it and everything, you know, and obviously, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, just great choice of cast, things like that, you know, just really picking the people carefully, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, when, do you remember the moment Tony first approached you about the universe? Yeah, it was about, I think it was about a, a year ago he mentioned, you know, what he was doing. I, got, I was like, oh, okay. You know, that's really interesting because <laughs> I haven't, I've been so busy, you know, with, with you know, in Fortnite that I hadn't really st stuck my heads into the weed too much on, you know, yeah. on Web three, et cetera, you know. So mm -hmm. it was a, it was a really interesting conversation. Again, it's like, well, it's interesting technology, and I, once again, you know, I do like things that are trying to do something a little bit different, you know. Mm -hmm. So, so it was about a year ago. I was like, oh, that's, that's really really interesting what you're doing. Mm -hmm. What stood out to you about the universe the most? Um. It solves some problems, right? And big opportunities. And there's there's a couple of things for me. A lot of games just now tend to be mashups of different styles of games because it's very hard to come up with something brand new and mm -hmm. stuff, right? Which nobody has seen before. It's just getting harder right. and harder. But then you do get kind of like, well, can we take this style of game and, and mash up with this game, you know? And uh, Battle Royales, for example, were a great example, right? Where, you know, okay, it was a traditional, you know, third person, for example, shooter game, but hey, right. we're, we're putting this Battle Royale mechanic, you know, and, and it just breathes new life into a genre. Um, mm. But what interested me the most was I looked at, I look at games like um, League of Legends, right? Mm. League of Legends was super interesting to me because once again, it was born out of a different franchise, right? It was born out of Warcraft 3 modding, right. you know, with Battle of the Ancients, you know. Um, and it's a great example of, you know, somebody taking something somebody else has done, remixing it and creating something out of it. Um, but the problem it hit was they they couldn't really take it forward because Blizzard never really knew what to do if something came a success, something built on their IP with their modding tools, right? It's like, they, I don't think they'd even thought that through. It's like, well, well, who owns that? Because it's kind of using a lot of elements. And therefore, you know, what was a shame was, you know, um, League of Legends kind of had to be rebuilt out of Dota, out of that franchise, out of that universe and mm -hmm. into a new one. Yep. Um, and then the same thing happened with Auto Chess in, uh, you know, in, in Dota as well. It was like, well, oh, really? here's, here's a cool thing, right? Somebody built Auto Chess and it was using the, you know, the, the, the franchise effectively, you know, that Valve had built. Mm -hmm. But again, they wanted to do their own game because they weren't quite sure how to monetize it, et cetera, which, which was a problem again. It's like, well, yeah. it's really hard to try and figure out all this business kind of stuff when something that happens. Mm -hmm. So again, they said, okay, well, we'll just have to rebuild it outside of Dota and you know, make it its own game and therefore reinvent another universe for it to live with new characters right. because we can't use the ones it came out of. Mm -hmm. And that's what I thought, you know, this is kind of what the universe seems to be trying to solve with new technology, right? Actually, we can actually make all that actually yeah. finally, you know, work. So yeah. for me, that was like, oh, that, that could be really interesting, really exciting. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I think there's, there's still a bit of, I think, kind of a discrepancy between Web3 and gaming where a lot of gamers aren't particularly convinced that Web3 mm -hmm. and crypto can... Um, solve these issues right because i think if you know yeah. for people that are coming from the side of web3 this is incredible because you have this really awesome asset that's 3d that you can you can actually use and you have that utility showcase it's not just a picture yeah. um but for gamers we're even now we're like trying to find the right um ways to communicate the messaging and showcase this is actually something that's going to give you utility and ownership right like ownership's what we're really trying to project what would you say to gamers that are a little bit hesitant about let's say becoming part of the universe or any other company that's trying to fuse gaming with Web3? Um, I actually don't think we should try and convince them too much. We just have to do it, mm -hmm. right? I mean, mm -hmm. honestly, that's all we have to do, right? It's like something will happen, right? And yeah. which will just become immediately apparent. Oh, n now I get it. it takes right? that one thing. Yeah, just that one thing. And and, mm -hmm. and that, that's all I think, you know, we have to keep looking for is let's just make something and then eventually a light bulb will click and go, people go, mm -hmm. oh, okay, get it, right? 
the, the more you have to try and explain it and convince them, I think, you know, it's it's just not the same as just putting something in front of saying, right. well, here you go, just just try it. And Absolutely. I, and I, I mean, it's like, yeah. it's same with like Web2, right? When Web2 was around, there's so many people that were like, this is not going to work. <laughs> yeah. This is yeah. not going to be successful. And then look at it today, right? And can't live game. without it. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's just so many examples again, right? So, um, yeah. so that's why I never, you know, yeah, never ever kind of like say never, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, because once again, people will always surprise us. Technology will always surprise us. Uh, yeah, I agree. What do you think? Do you think that community community ownership will allow for better games in the future? Uh, yes, and I think it, I think it will allow, like I said, you know, people just to be much more confident that that you know there is a clear path for them if they want to make a game, create a game, mm-hmm. you know, have assistance in making it because there's a lot of tools and technology there. Right. Understand that even if they do that, there's actually a very clear business case of how they make money going forward, mm-hmm. etc. I think just just by having all that nice and cleanly structured and understandable, I mm-hmm. think that will lead to because then you don't have to worry about things like you know. What happens if it's a game of success and then we can't mm-hmm. do what we thought or can't do that? Then I think that really, really helps. Yeah, I agree. I think we have such fantastic writers on our team that have created such a beautiful lore and story to the universe that in many ways is created to have these opportunities and to allow for imagination and creativity and new yeah. ideas from the community. But it's also very much tailored to and has a lot of ground rules where there's certain things you can and cannot do. Um, and I think that that ultimately is what will help people have at least some sort of guideline and um, allow them to kind of come together and be like, okay, here's what we can do, but we cannot do that. And at least have games work together, right? Because if we're thinking about community ownership, there's going to be hopefully hundreds of games being created in this one universe, universe, um, and how those will be compatible with each other, which is, I think, something I'm really curious about is, well, at some point we'll have games being built simultaneously Mm -hmm. and how will they able to be kind of living in the same world because i don't think we've ever really seen that happen right like there's never been multiple games being created at the same time that live all in the same world yeah. i'm very curious where where that will go what do you think i mean you've had a, you, you've had a lot of experience with gaming franchises what does a good franchise have to do to have or what, what does it have to do right to have longevity oh um for me, it's 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 all about the the update cycle, right? It's 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 about making the world, you know, um, constantly evolve the same way the real world does in terms of mm-hmm. just you know something new every day, every week, and mm-hmm. and that's always tricky. So it, it's easier to do with a with a bigger franchise, right? Because because there's so many directions you can take it, um, the, the, there's so many different experiences you can deliver into it. Mm-hmm. But 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 keeping it fresh, keeping it new, so that there's always a reason for players to go. Well, I'm maybe not played for a few days, but oh, you know, this just came across. You know, my email. I just saw my friend, you know, doing this. It's like there's some new stuff there. I need to go back and you know and check it out. So right. it really is about you know keeping the world fresh and alive. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Thank you so much. I have one last question that I have to ask you that I ask everybody at the end of this series. Um, I like to call it a world building secret, right? Given the name. What do you, is there any kind of advice you can give for anyone that's interested in programming, developing, even just, you know, working in games um, that's part of the universe community because that's, they're going to be watching this and they're going to be very excited. Um, Mm -hmm. What could you, what kind of advice could you give them that will potentially maybe inspire them or at least help to start on the right track? Um, For me, it's like, just look for one single element you want to do really, really well. Don't don't try and be you know too broad and uh, you know with your goals or your ideas. It's the worst. The worst thing a lot of times you can do with design is have a blank piece of paper because it's mm-hmm. it's actually you, you just go around in circles sometimes going nowhere. You know. So I actually like sometimes having a lot of constraints. You know. So it's because because it helps you focus about okay, right. I can't do that. I can't do that. But I can do this one thing. If I do that really well. And that might resonate with people, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, just pick your battles, pick them well, um, but 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 try and keep them, you know, concise and self-contained, and you know, um, you know, do big things with little things. It's kind of like my piece of advice. Do big things with little things. I love that, <laughs> Dave. Thank you so much for coming on. No problem, pleasure.